Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I think we're just going to jump right in. Uh, we're going to do a little bit of introductions, and then we're going to kind of go over the agenda, and then I'm going to quickly um, kind of hand it over to our esteemed guests um, to kind of talk about uh, the Aquinas College Albertus Magnus Hall project. Um, it's an exciting project. They have a tremendous story, and I'm glad they're here to share it, and I'm glad you all are here to kind of participate in uh, the presentation and hopefully have a lively discussion afterward. So um, my name, as it says underneath my face, is Matthew Van Sweden, uh, a formerly at Catalyst Partners, now at Foresight Management. Um, and uh, in my role at, at Catalyst, I helped the uh, or worked with uh, the design team in, in getting this project certified. It, it achieved LEED version four gold certification. Um, and so that's my involvement of this project. Um, but it's got a tremendous story uh, on its own right. Um, and I have with us uh, invited Ryan Archer, Director of Healthcare at Tower Pinkster, kind of leading the, the design team. And then uh, Sister Danny Marie of Aquinas College, who was uh, <laughs> a force to be reckoned with um, <laughs> when, when it came to uh, setting a high standard of excellence on the design team and, and really shooting for aspirational targets. Um, and uh, just personally, tremendously inspirational working with, with Sister Damien um, on this project just because she, uh, um, she pushed us all uh, towards excellence. And I think that's, you'll see the result of that in a little bit. Um, Andrew Cunin is on the call too. He's the co-chair of the command environment with me. Um, he's on baby duty, so he is muted, but um, he's there, he's around. Uh, send him a chat if you want. Um, a little bit before we get into the actual presentation, uh, just a moment to, to thank the folks that make this all happen. So these are our AIA Grand Rapids uh, sponsors. Um, they provide the, ooh, I don't know how it does. I didn't push a button and I just jumped ahead. Um, they provide the resources that our chapter um, needs to do this work, to have these meetings, to share the, these resources. Uh, and um, in a large part, we couldn't do what we are doing without their support. So just a moment to thank all of them. Um, and then uh, kind of a rough agenda. I'm not a formal guy. Um, my face kind of tells a story of informality. So uh, I don't like to dwell too much on agendas, but they provide a great framework um, for kind of understanding what we're doing today. Um, and uh, the, so we're going to spend a few minutes just talking about um, the framework for design excellence. Uh, Ryan's going to kind of in past, if, if you're <laughs> joined us in other events, um, I've kind of led the, the intro to whatever framework, uh, design for integration and design for discovery is what you've done in the past. Um, Ryan's actually going to lead that uh, just simply to change things up a little bit and because I think he's got a really unique perspective and expertise in this, in this space. Uh, so I'm gonna let him do that. And then uh, Sister Damien Marie is gonna walk us through the kind of owner and student uh, experience of, of this project. Um, and then hopefully we get to get through that in 40 minutes or so. And then we can kind of go into a, a really robust question and answer session. Um, that's largely unstructured. Um, I have some ideas for structure and we'll kind of play it by ear as we get into that space. But um, as you're listening, as you're hearing, um, I encourage you all to, to kind of jot down things that kind of speak to you or jump out at you. And um, we can certainly kind of revisit those in that 40 minute Q&A. Um, and from my perspective, um, that has been the most valuable time uh, simply because it's, it's kind of more most robust exchange of ideas and perspectives. And um, it's just a really great time. So really looking forward to that, um, that time together after the presentations. So to, to begin, and, and again, those of you who have joined me in, on other design for um, framework for design excellence sessions, this may be a little bit of a repeat, but I try to start off every one of these events with just a reintroduction to the framework for design excellence. Um, again, it's a web-based resource for, for anybody really, but principally architects um, and their teams. And um, one of these days I'll, I'll be brave enough to just do this live because really legitimately what you need to do is just go to the Google machine and type in framework for design excellence. Um, and this website will show up and this is the kind of landing page. 
Um, and what you do to kind of get to the PDF is you right there on the right hand side, you'll see the um, Framework Design Excellence link. You can click on that and that will, that will download a PDF that isn't connected to live updates that you'll see on the website, but then you can have it um, locally or offline or whatever, um, and you can kind of share it with your design team um, as a resource. Um, but then if you're on the website, you kind of scroll down and you'll start to see um, this matrix of um, what they're called design principles. So design for fill in the blank. Um, if you remember, we've, we've talked about design for integration a couple, a couple months ago. Um, last month, we talked about design for discovery. And this month, we're going to be talking about um, design for well-being. Uh, and, and so if you click into each one of these, it will kind of give you a little bit more robust um, call it toolkit. Um, but it has the prompts from the toolkit, and it has resources, it has case studies. It kind of walks you through a little bit more um, sophisticated and robust set of information if you're kind of curious. So um, if after the end of this presentation, you still have some um, curiosity itches to scratch, uh, I encourage you all to, like I said, just Google Framework for Design Excellence, uh, click on the Design for Wellbeing um, link there, and then kind of browse to your heart's content. There's, there's like I said, a lot of information there. Um, so with that out of the way, uh, I'm going to tee up Ryan. He's going to uh, share uh, a little bit more about the framework and he's going to share the prompts, but then kind of go into how the, the Tower Pinkster team really approached this project through the lens of well being. So with that, Ryan, you are up. Well, sure. Well, um, good afternoon, everybody. While well, I'm dialing this thing up here, um, there we go. Uh, it should be coming up for everybody. Um, like Matthew said, um, Ryan Archer, uh, designer and uh, healthcare guy with Tower Pinkster for the years, and you know, and certainly, um, I just want to take a moment and say thanks to the AIA for for having us, and and uh, thank you to Sister Damien personally because I think it's been um, it's been one of those projects that you you don't get a lot of opportunities to do something like this in your career, uh, and so um, you know certainly we're we're very thankful uh, to Sister Damien and the Aquinas community. Um, at large. Uh, so that being said, um, so talk a little bit about design for well-being. So I think there's uh, some key bullet points, and I think hopefully there's some things that are um, maybe obvious responses architecturally to what we've done for this. And I think there's some things that we certainly would be interested in talking about further during the discussion with this. Um, so, you know, a series of points, you know, natural and artificial lighting. We all understand how lighting um, impacts well-being in spaces. Thermal comfort, which is always, you know, one of the funny things you hear people complaining about. Everyone's either too hot or too cold, and it can be two different people in the exact same room, and everyone has a different experience. So, how do you, how do you begin to manage that? Indoor air quality, and you know, certainly making sure the space uh, just isn't bad for people to breathe in, you know, that the, the, the better air you get, the better you're going to perform academically and, and just feel better. Happiness, you know, that's always one of those um, quantitative or qualitative, I guess, uh, ideas. And, you know, I, I certainly think trying to make a space where, where students want to be and where faculty want to be and really creating a, a community is something that, that the happiness can, can attest to. Biophilia connection to nature. Um, you know, we were joking about this in some of the prep sessions for today. Uh, part of our job was easy as the design team because it's a it's a beautiful campus, and um, it makes it very easy to connect that to nature. It's certainly, something the past several I don't know maybe ten years or so we've we've had an increase in awareness of is acoustics and how uh, buildings acoustic performance and uh, can really impact people. And then, you know, the other one, we're maybe not going to do as deep a dive today, but food movement and exercise, trying to make a place that does encourage people to, to move and physically just get around in. And I, I think there are some things that, um, you know, we, we can think about moving forward with that. And then there's, there's some prompt questions. And I think, you know, those are probably, I'd say, think about these and put them in your hip pocket as we talk through the plan about um, just how the project maybe could do some of these things and, and some responses. You know, so how can design encourage a healthy lifestyle? You know, provide greater occupant comfort. You know, a big one is being welcoming and inclusive for all. 
and then um, connect people with place and nature and then you know reduce hazards you know a kind of first do no harm type of situation and, and you know along with with thanking sponsors you know what we do is a team sport and uh, I, I really believe that firmly and I, I'd be remiss if I didn't thank everyone that was involved and um, you know certainly from an ownership Aquinas has been great um, RFD out of San Diego is our lab planner um, Teton Designs, I know a lot of you know Bert, uh, did the structural, more in Brugink, helping with civil, uh, Catalyst Partners, again, obviously helping with, with the lead certification, and then um, certainly the team at Pioneer Construction as the construction manager were all, you know, great to work with. And certainly, you know, a great project requires a great client, and then it also requires a great team. So just a little bit about Aquinas, because, you know, I lived in Grand Rapids 25 years, and for a long time, I didn't actually know where the campus was, um, you know, but uh, it's kind of the hidden jewel right in the center. It's literally down the street from our office up Fulton, but, um, you know, established uh, in the late 1900s or late 1800s up in, up in Traverse and moved to the current campus in 45. Um, it's over 100 acres. It's beautiful. Um, you know, and, and sits right next to Wilcox Park. So there's this natural, beautiful transition of of landscape as you go go between them. And I think the important piece is, is a college-wide focus on sustainability. And um, it it's injected into everything, you know, from the minute you kind of step on campus as a student until you graduate. And I think that is a really great way to help people understand and prioritize some of the things we we did here and, not, and think about them as investments and not necessarily thinking about them as just lost cost. So the, the building, a lot of you will remember if you've driven up and down Robinson and Road at all over the past 70 years or something, um, you know, that, that uh, Albertus Magnus Hall has sat there. It's this, you know, kind of great 1950s, early 60s building, had a, an addition in the late 80s, and that was really the last time the building was touched. Um, you know, so you're looking at a, a corridor that's, you know, block and terrazzo, and it's just I think it was just LVT too, and um, ceiling tiles, and it, it they did a great amount of work with the space they had, but it was it was obviously past due for an upgrade. Um, you know, most students on campus go through this building and touch it in some way, and so it was very important for the college to be able to to make these upgrades. And so we effectively um, doubled the square footage, so the the existing building um, just wasn't kind of up to snuff in terms of modern labs and so that was really the big the big goal of that i did want to just show a little bit because it, it's been a journey uh, personally and then also for the college i've been working on this on and off since 2009 um and then you know certainly uh probably every three or four years we we were able to to touch it again and really i i'm super super thankful we were finally able to make the project a reality so Again, like I said, it, it's super easy to think about, you know, the biophilia and connection to nature when that's a drone shot of the building and you're able to just kind of tuck this thing into the heart of campus and really have science be on display, but also have science be respectful of its surroundings and, you know, try to be a neighbor to the neighborhoods of the South, um, you know, try and think about the kids coming to it on campus. And again, just some historical shots and early massing ideas as we were really beginning to think about the building. Now, right here, the existing site plan. Um, so this half of the building here on the right is the existing building with the lab addition on the left. We, we had to reroute a road. That was probably the, the biggest piece of that. And unfortunately, that came with some tree clearing. And we'll talk a little bit about that later. But uh, that just allowed us to add on and have the building um, be organized. So a uh, basement lower level, uh, one of the main goals was to kind of, there was some student space down there and things we really wanted to dedicate that. Instead of having students be in the basement, really get them up um, in the building and then dedicate the basement just to, you know, support functions, things like that. So first floor, just to give everyone a quick orientation, uh, north up, uh, uh, accessibility ramp, some large format stairs, more for outdoor greeting, you know, outdoor gatherings, things like that. Main stairs, the building's really centered around that atrium with the existing on the right and then the, the new on the left. 
The loading and receiving area was the old lecture hall. Uh, I couldn't dig up any pictures of it for, for today, but it, it, that was the initial study. And so we were able to add you know, a nice new lecture hall, really um, increase the ability to teach in that space, as well as just make it a much better space to be in. Uh, a series of labs, as you move up the building, and we'll talk about the section here in just a second. The second floor is really the main connector, connector of the, the building. It's the only flat floor between the three. Um, you know, the other two have some ramping and that's really what the atrium helps do programmatically. Uh, the second floor is dedicated to the biology program. The first floor was more physical sciences, physics and geography and things. Um, and then also has the, the green roof over the lecture hall. So again, that that's, it gives you an opportunity to step outside. Third floor, the original building had the chemistry on the second floor. Um, the only problem with that is you still need to vent your uh, exhaust fans for all your chemistry hoods and things. And so uh, this I think was a big thing we were able to do is get the chemistry up onto third floor and exhausting it directly out of the top of the building, which is you know, a much more conventional approach, but it also is more energy efficient. It, it creates better indoor environmental air quality because you know, you're not having to pump makeup air as, as far, things like that. It was really, a pretty big deal. Uh, just a quick, you know, I had a friend uh, tell me once the section uh, tells the story of a building. And so conceptually, you know, we had kind of stacked it originally thinking about how the building is going to organize itself. And then um, you see some of the ramping in the stairs between the levels, um, particularly the floor to floor height was an existing 12 feet needed to actually drive some depth into those to make them function better for for modern teaching labs, I think we ended up around 15 or 16, I think 15, four, I think. Um, but the idea then we had to make it up with stairs because the larger idea of the building is that it wasn't supposed to feel like an addition, right? That the 80s addition really felt like it was a, an alien piece of architecture, the existing building. And so recladding the building, but then also trying to organize the interior in a way that make sure it feels contiguous and make sure it feels like as a student who's trying to get their way, you know, through class, as a faculty member, it, the building hopefully made sense and, and they're able to get through it. And again, just a couple of vignette moments in the section. Um, my engineers would be mad if I didn't show the, the uh, strobic fans, um, you know, and certainly I always think it's a fun moment with a lab building to let it be a lab building. To, because again, I think it puts some of those ideas for design and well-being on display. That we're thinking about air, we're thinking about um, safety, you know, all of those things. Uh, greenhouse again, pretty cool space up on top. But then just you know, you'll notice a couple of slides ago it was just this corridor. We were able to widen that corridor out, um, update the finishes, create student spaces in it. You know, the phrase I had a friend tell me from Western: sticky spaces, right? that there's a, an adhesion to those places where students want to be and they want to stop and they want to stay because then you begin to have a much more collaborative and I think an enjoyable environment in the space. Just some exterior studies. And again, this was a really collaborative process. We were meeting, I think it was pretty much every other week for a, a solid year to talk about design ideas and share them with Aquinas and say, you know, we don't think this is appropriate for us. We think this is a really cool idea. And that type of collaboration, because at the end of the day, it, it really is their building, I think gives the client a sense of ownership, gives the team a very clear way to approach it. And then I think you just end up with a stronger, more well thought out project. So, Again, main approach, um, most of campus is behind you in this shot. Uh, again, the existing building is on the left side of this picture with the, uh, the new labs on the right. Again, organized around that central atrium, but really trying to create a plaza because they have, you know, students from some of the you know, local schools will come over the course of the year. So there's, a, you know, a bus drop off sequence and things like that, but it also is again, an engagement with the community and it's a way to get get people thinking about a Aquinas as an option for education but also that it's very plain there they want to promote sustainability and, and engagement with the community so the other big 
component, and I think this gets a little bit to well-being for the faculty standpoint, one of the things that they were really interested in was research. And so we were able to add some research labs into the building as well. And again, ties the faculty research and the student research together. And, and sister probably can talk way better about that than I can. Um, but again, even with the labs, you know, one of the things RFD suggested was, you know, overhead carriers. And so what that does is it creates a dance floor in the lab space proper, which increases flexibility. So we're not having to renovate as often. You're not putting as much, you know, material cost into the building to have the building be responsive. We can pull some things down, shuffle tables. Those are not easy tables to move, granted. Um, the tables are heavy, but you know, you're not locked into one type of teaching situation where if all the all the desks were were kind of bolted down to the floor. I think you know, one of the spaces that that's it's just kind of a fun spot to be in is the central atrium. So this is the the view just as you walk in the building. Um, and then a, a subtle thing, but I think it gets back to a thermal comfort issue, an acoustics issue, and an air quality issue, is along here you'll see um, it's actually a stylized pattern of the human genome. And really kind of we're able to make a um, custom grill for the mechanical system. And then it's a basically a displacement ventilation system. So instead of trying to blow air down, which is, creates noise, it's not very as comfortable, we, our engineering team was able to push that cold air down, have it come out low not, and warm air too, I guess, um, at, a, at a reasonable velocity. It's comfortable, it's relatively quiet, and it, it's a higher quality of air. So it's just a, a, a subtle thing, but something I thought that was a pretty neat contribution in terms of some of the things we're, we're thinking and talking about today. Just a, a, again, a series of shots of the of the building in the space. I think the lecture hall is another one we want to talk a little bit about, just because it does touch on acoustics as well. You know, I, you don't have to use a stage voice and project too much in there. There is sound reinforcement, um, you know, for people that need it, but also programmatically, again, to reinforce collaboration. The desks are actually on alternating or on two to one riser heights, so. Uh, in this row, I'm pointing at my screen, there's a Zoom file everyone else has made over the years. Um, the one row can just turn around and face their peers behind them. And so you can have collaboration um, on every other row and not have to necessarily be pushing furniture around as much to, to do things like that. And then again, the acoustic control on the sides with the panels. So, you know, I think it's, as I'm just kind of clicking through, you know, obviously the green roof, we're able to capture a little bit of stormwater, but it also just gives you a nice moment uh, to be outside, have some respite as a faculty or you know member or a student, um, and and again creates a place that allows you to engage with nature and still feel um, you know maybe you've got a sense of ownership or privacy of that of that space as well. So I I want to turn it over. I'm going to stop sharing. Um, to, to actually the actual star of the show. I think she's got a, a lot more interesting stuff to talk about, just living in the building, right? You know, and so um, Sister Damian Marie, I'll, I'll let you uh, take it over. Well, thank you so much, Ryan. And um, so, somewhat humble, I would say, but, and, and also thank you to Matt. I mean, it has really been a team effort and I would, I would emphasize that uh, we needed each one of us because each each group kind of took a particular niche in the in making the project come to fruition, and I think it also was a kind of design for well-being that improved each one of us individually on the team. And and that's maybe not something that's in the framework for design excellence, but I, I think that happens sometimes too. So it makes our all of our jobs more meaningful. So um, as as Ryan said, I. Sister Damien Ray, and I'm the Dean of Science and Sustainability at Aquinas. And when I was hired on in 2016, I was told, well, we've had this long process, as Ryan said, since 2009, if not before, trying to figure out what to do with the science building, because it really needed upgrading. Nowadays, when students come in, they're looking to do research, even at the undergraduate level, they're looking for top-notch labs. 
And our labs, as good as they were when the building was first built in 1959, they were just, it, it needed to be revamped. So the president at the time just said, you know, I really want that to be one of your number one priorities. And I think it was the second day I was on the job, we had a meeting <laughs> with uh, Tower Pinkster and some of the other parties involved. And we did end up meeting for, I would say it was nine months to a year, just on the design process. Part of that was, you know, practicality. I, I wanted to be sure that I was new to the college. I wanted to make sure that what we did in the building was what we really needed for the sciences. And part of it, I think, was also just making sure that we gave it time before we just jumped in to the building process, which I think happens sometimes on some of the projects and that that's, can be problematic. So I think if you want this biophilic design and happiness and design for well-being, it does take time up front. So we really had to discipline. And I had to kind of be a go-between with the administration, you know, that was sort of chomping at the bit like, well, uh, when are we gonna break ground kind of thing. And, um, but what we did during that nine months was tremendously valuable. So I would advocate it if it's possible on any projects. We met, as Ryan said, every other week. And in between, I was talking with the faculty and we talked about what, what did we want for like the philosophy of the building, which sounds maybe kind of strange, but it's not at all. And it's very much harmonious with this framework idea what did we want the building to speak? And one thing that came through very clearly was the biophilic design because the campus is very beautiful and dedicated to sustainability. And then something that spoke our approach as a Catholic liberal arts institution, our kind of holistic approach to education and an approach that uh, really tries to foster the individual student and the well being of the student, um, a collaborative building that allowed, because on campus we have very few spaces where students can actually work together. And we really want, wanted a place where they could come and feel like they could work together. And a building of beauty, a building that sort of was in harmony with the mission of the college. So I, I would say that collaborative process was wonderful. It, there were difficult moments because we did have to cut out some square footage, you know, the, the costing and all of that. But in the, when you're working together, it softens it somehow, because when we were cutting out one thing, we were maybe able to capture it somewhere else because we were in communication with one another and, and people's needs were well known. And it also kind of prevents like one person or group sort of capturing a process and advocating very strongly for what they want to, and those who are quiet are not getting as much input. So I, I really made an effort for everyone to be able to to give input. And then having such a collaborative design team <clears throat> was really good because that stakeholder engagement is really important. And you, <clears throat> you need div diverse perspectives. You know, one of us might say, well, we really need this. And then maybe the designer said, well, we can't do that, but we do this, you know? And I think one thing that came out in that process was the importance of acoustics in the building, which Ryan commented on, and I'll talk a little bit more. I hadn't thought along those lines at all, nor had the, the other faculty. So for some of the themes of the college, Ryan mentioned uh, science on display. We wanted it to be <clears throat> when people walked in the building, they would, without being corny, they would feel the kind of the beauty of science and the holistic approach to science that we take. And then the, the mission of the college, there are, it's, a, it's a Dominican college, the Dominican sisters founded it. I'm a Franciscan sister, but I have permission to be here from the Dominicans. <laughs> um, but there are four pillars that we try to, uh, to keep at the center of what we're doing in education. And those are prayer, study, service, and community. And so we wanted to try to enhance those components as much as we could through the design of the building. So a building that enhanced study, that was number one, right? So from the room design, the overall layout to the furniture. It's the building is set up to encourage focused attention. And this might sound like a small detail, but one of the things the faculty told me in a meeting was, we don't want places where students go to sleep, you know, like uh, big areas where they could lay down or whatever. We want to be sure that the building speaks that this is a place for attentiveness in your studies. 
And it, I can honestly say there's very few times where I see any student sleeping because we, we took that into account. I think there's something very important about that. Students today struggle a lot with distractions. Probably they're so used to so many distractions and the building is meant to minimize distractions and really help focus on study in a kind of like a serene attentiveness. Technically, we wanted top-notch labs. And I can say I went to visit about six other college labs while in the process, one of them being Notre Dame. And I think that our building is equal, if not better than some of the top-notch labs, even at MSU or University of Michigan, because we were able to do this kind of collaborative design process and design for what we really needed. So we have up-to-date IT capabilities. We were able to get some new equipment, an instrument lab for the nursing program, the, the nursing sim lab, which we, were, we never had before. Our students had to go down to St. Mary's Hospital and it was very difficult to do sim work. Now we actually have a sim lab that was highly collaborative in its design where students actually go in and there are hospital beds there. There's all the, the um, monitors. So if you can have a, a, a robot who's having a heart attack and the students are in there having to deal with it as if they were in an actual hospital room. We have maternity and med surge. So all of that, I think just top notch capabilities so that you're coming to a small college but you're getting a really top notch study experience. We also needed more classroom space. The whole campus is short on classroom space. And so we did design quite a bit of classroom space. And we were so glad that we did that because we, we moved into the building about a month and a half before COVID hit. And thank God we had this extra space because with social distancing and things, we, we, were, we would have had to rent space otherwise if we didn't have the building. We also needed a flexible building because basically the administration said, you know, this is going to be our building for the next 50 years. So make sure it's flexible. If we have new programs or we need new labs, can you try to design that in there? So we did, we did try to do that. We, instead of leaving the space, so like some open space, for example, on the third floor, we actually made those into classrooms since we need that space for classrooms, but they're all flat floors. It could be very easily made into a lab and vented out through the roof if we need that sometime in the future. It'll be the next dean or whatever who has to deal with that. But we wanted to make sure we built in that kind of flexibility. The same thing with the furniture. It helped us to cut costs to make all the furniture kind of standard. So all the classroom chairs are the same. So they could be moved around from one class to the other. All the, the, the uh, lab stools are the same. And that actually helped us save costs so we could do some extra things that we wanted to do for the design, as well as just make the building more flexible for the future. If we have different events it, you know, and we need more chairs, we just go to another classroom and get the chairs. Community is another pillar at Aquinas and it's a very important pillar. Aquinas has a strong community spirit. And the faculty wanted a friendly and a warm building because so many people are afraid of science and science buildings can be a bit intimidating. So that was one message that came out in our discussions internally very strongly. We want this to be welcoming. Every student at Aquinas has to take two science courses, whatever your major is, it's part of our core curriculum. So we want everyone to feel welcome to be in here and to understand that science actually is a welcoming and a very communally oriented profession. Um, we wanted collaborative spaces for hands-on learning. That's very important now, and even just for gathering. And I have to say during COVID, we were open for face-to-face -face instruction. It was really kind of a hybrid, but um, we've had students in here all during hybrid, all during the COVID, and they have been very peacefully working. It's rare that there's a lot of loud noise. They've just gathered together, done their work and focused on what, what needs to happen. Every floor has a variety of student spaces, some for larger gatherings, some for individual or private spaces. There's a small library on the second floor. Um, and I have to mention the second floor bridge, and I do this in homage to one of our chemistry professors who makes sure I always mention this when I talk about the building. 
the bridge, as Ryan showed you, there are bridges connecting each wing. And originally they were just kind of a narrow bridge just as a walkway or a hallway. And this professor, the chemistry professor said, well, could we widen it so there could be seating there? Because it's a beautiful view. It's kind of a bird's eye view out to the pond and down below to the atrium. And to the credit, so I thank Ryan and the, the team for saying, well, we could do that. And so we did widen that and it's a favorite space now, both for faculty and students. Prayer is another, another uh, pillar for the college. We don't have a chapel, though we actually did discuss having a small chapel in the building, but we had just completed a, a chapel, not just like a block up from where the science building is. And so we decided that might not be the best use of the space, but we put in a small library instead. And I think we, we were seeking though in the building that it be kind of a contemplative experience when you come in. So it's, it's a very beautiful building and we want, just like we want, we feel the world around us inspires awe and wonder. We wanted people when they walked into the building to think, wow, is this what science is about? This is awesome. And we have these beautiful lights in the atrium, which even the neighbors comment on it because they see them from across the, the street. And absolutely gorgeous. They kind of reminiscent of chemical structures, but they're very beautiful. Some people have said to me, I love your beautiful art pieces in the ceiling. And I said, well, those are actually lights, <laughs> but they think of them as, as art pieces. It's um, the, other, the other theme that came out very, importantly, was the need for light. So when I visited the other science buildings, many times science labs are in the interior of the building and that's kind of gives you that dark feeling. And the, the faculty and even the students that we spoke with commented on this, they wanted light. So we moved all the labs and classrooms to the outside of the building. I'm sorry. I'm getting... There we go, sorry, getting the phone call. Um, so all of the labs, offices, classrooms are on the outside of the building and there's lots of light. Sometimes we are, most of the time, I never even turn on the lights in my office because there's so much natural light. And then the lights also, and thanks to Tower Pinkster for this, in the in the labs and the cl classrooms are beautiful. They, they are programmed so that when there's a lot of light coming in from the outside, the bank of lights closest to the windows don't light up. In fact, we thought there was something wrong with the lights. So I was calling, I think our lights aren't working. And then we were told no, because they're programmed to have a certain average amount of light in the classroom. And so if there's a lot of exterior light, you don't have those bays don't light up. And it's, we have the data showing that students learn better with natural light. And there's no doubt, I, I work better, I can tell you. My eyes are not as tired in, in, the, in the offices here because of the natural light. And I, I think retention for students is better and attentiveness is better with the natural light. It's also beautiful. So some of the faculty kind of fight for which classroom they want. There's one on the third floor and it sort of feels like you're up in a tree house because you're right at the tree level and there's some beautiful trees. And that's what we want. We want people to want to be in the building. And both Matt and, and Ryan were very important in supporting our efforts to, to make the building a sustainable building. So, and I had to do some fighting, so I, maybe I was somewhat formidable with this, but I just thought since the college is spending so much on this, and we are trying to be a model of sustainability, then we should model it in what we do. And it did require some extra work, but really not a huge, in proportion to like the $30 million expense for this building, the percentage spent to make us more sustainable was a very small percentage. It was more the thinking and the working together to make it happen and to try to get this in from the beginning. So I did kind of have to harp on it up front because the first responses were a little bit, you know, okay, well, sister, even from on campus, why don't we just do a LEED certified building? Or maybe, and then it was like, oh, we could do LEED silver. And then I started looking at it thinking, could we do LEED gold? What would we need to do to get to that point? And I really thank Matt for 
kind of being willing to hang in with me there and come up with different options so that we are so proud. This is the only Lee Gold building that we have on campus. And to have a science building be that is, I think, wonderful. And so we're very, very proud of that. The green roof was another thing. I kind of had to fight for that one. It was a little extra cost because we had to put more steel reinforcement in the in what's the floor of the green roof and the roof of the of the lecture hall. But it's a favorite spot. It's used by everyone on campus and it's it's can it's used as an outdoor classroom by our biology professors. It's right outside the general biology lab. And it's it's just a wonderful spot. And when people come through the building, they always want to see that green roof. So I think very important that we did that. Then we also, as Ryan mentioned, we had to take down some trees when we did the expansion. And there were a couple of really large trees. And if any of you have been to Aquinas, you know it's a very forested campus and trees are very important to us. We had to take down a large, very large and old oak and a very large and old um, beech tree. And that was hard to do. And some of the neighbors were a little upset. Um, and I was trying to think, I was really kind of sad about it because they were gorgeous trees. And I tried to think, how would, could we really steward this? Because there was no choice. The designers and the, and the pioneer told us, there's no way you can do this without taking those trees down. So what we did was I asked pioneer if they'd be willing to cut like slices, cookies of the trees. And uh, they had to get a special chainsaw to do it, but they were out on the site anyway, and they were willing to do it because we had been collaborating, working together. It wasn't an impersonal situation. So they cut a bunch of these slices and then we dried them in the stairwell for during the construction process, so a year and a half or so. Then when we went to, to design the furniture, because we were saving money by standardizing the furniture, I said, okay, now can we go to the custom lab of Custer and talk with them about what we could do with these cookies? Because I had thought that maybe we could make them into tables and you, you know, have them in the building. So it would be a way of stewarding these trees going forward. And that actually did work out. They came up with a resin process and we went with like a blue resin for the, the Great Lakes and all the water in West Michigan. And uh, we now have, I think, six of these tables. Some are in the student area, some are in the atrium, some are outside uh, my office in that kind of office area. And then we have one that's mounted on the wall and the professors can bring their students down and teach them in the botany class from this, this actual uh, tree that was once on our campus. So I feel it wasn't perfect, but I think that was a great way that we could steward these resources into into the future and we can teach now others about this. So I guess just a few final comments. I think the, the acoustic controls were extremely important and that was something I wasn't very keyed into. I do have an engineering background, but I was not keyed into the importance of acoustic controls. And I think that Matt had mentioned the other day that sound disruption is the most important factor now in influencing how people respond and occupy a place. And that is definitely the case in here. When you walk in the building, you can feel everyone, you don't whisper, but you almost feel like you're, you, there's a settled feeling in the building. It's not a lot of echoing. You can, you don't hear from room, one room to the other, from one office to the other, from one classroom to the other. There is a sense, it's very focused and the, the acoustic control is absolutely adds to kind of a contemplative sense when you walk in the building. So I, I'm very convinced that that's very important. And I watch the students come in, they're so settled in here. There's not a lot of moving around, even as they're sitting there, they feel very settled and they're very focused on their work. So, and as I said, it's rare to hear them talking very loudly or doing something rambunctious. I think, and another thing, the airflow is very important. You can tell there's more fresh air flowing through the building. You don't get that lag that sometimes you get at 3.30, which you're probably all feeling right now <laughs> after listening to us. Uh, with COVID, we didn't have to put extra filters in. And so that was a huge savings for the college as well. So that kind of worked out together. Um, 
so I guess just to say in conclusion, you're never quite sure. I mean, during the design process, we were working so hard together and everybody was quite responsive. And sometimes it was tense trying to work it all out. And then you're thinking, is this, is this worth it, you know, going through all this extra effort? But it definitely is. I, I, I think that when you're living in the building and it's a reality and you see the responses of others, you see how welcome they feel, you see how kind of attentive they are to their work, how much they want to come in here. And you realize, okay, this was worth it. The building does affect how people respond. And for me, it's been very enlightening to see kind of the words and the theory be put into reality and to see that it, it actually works. It's, it's far superior to a traditional building. I'm, I'm just convinced now. And the expenses to do it were really small in comparison with the amount being spent on the building itself. It does require more talking together. And sometimes that is difficult because there are some times where we simply just don't want what seems to be a roadblock or someone else's idea and how are we going to incorporate that. But when a lot happens through that process of human collaboration that I think is also felt somehow in the way the building has a kind of sense of integrality to it and a, and a sense of peacefulness. So I think I would, I would stop there. Or maybe I could say one last thing, even the neighbors are happy because initially some of the tensions were the neighbors in this beautiful neighborhood in East Grand Rapids saying, wait a minute, you're gonna be tearing apart and doubling this building. And now there, so many have come by and I've even had calls saying, when are you opening up after COVID? Because we'd really like to come in and see the building. So that to me speaks a lot because we were very concerned about some of those tensions at the beginning too. So thank you very much. And again, I want to thank Matt and Ryan and the whole team for all the efforts that helped to make this a reality. Thank you so much, sister. I mean, it's always such a pleasure to listen to you talk about this project and, and to hear your passion and, and just kind of your, your um, just inspiration um, speaking to all the different elements. Yeah, I have to say like, um, you know, I was always told like, great design is invisible right um like it's not something that hits you over the top of the head it kind of like it just goes away because it's it's thoughtful and well designed right um and i have to say that when ryan and i were chatting about which principal to kind of talk to with this project uh design for wellness wasn't the first one that came to my mind mm. um and and that's shame on me because like um what what i find fascinating and just listening to you and ryan talk about this project is is how much of the 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 thinking behind that, the research that goes into um, like the well building standard and the design for well being kind of principle, you kind of adopted because you were thinking about the holistic, the, the human, the student experience, the faculty experience, right? And so it was super rooted in human needs, which is essentially what the whole framework design for well being is all about. So you did it without talking about it and you did it so exceptionally because it was part of the process from the very beginning. So I just like, I just wanna take a moment and like just pause and, and just say, um, this what a tremendous story and what a tremendous project this is. And just kudos to, to the design team and kudos to um, you, Sister Dana Marie and Aquinas College for having the vision and, and um, the fortitude, I guess, to make it a reality, right? <laughs> um, Thank you. So um, that said, I, I'm, we're gonna kind of go into the more Q&A part of the presentation. Um, well, it's not really a presentation anymore. Now it's gonna be a conversation. Um, so I mentioned I don't really have a whole lot of structure and that was just in part because a couple sessions ago, um, the presentation or the, the participation dwindled to the point where what I had in mind didn't really work out because it wasn't designed to work at a, such a small scale, but there's quite a number of us still around um, so we're going to do a little activity before we get to the Q&A because there's um, just about 30 of us and I think that's a perfect size. So I'm going to share my screen and kind of talk through some housekeeping stuff. Um, it's called the uh, one, three, all exercise. And um, if you were on the call last couple times, um, you probably have been familiar with this. 
Uh, and I'm not able to, hold on. Well, I thought I got my technology blunder out of the way. Um, there it is. Yeah, good. So um, here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna take uh, the first 10 minutes or so, and we're gonna go through a little exercise. And then we're gonna kind of hopefully share um, and kind of get to a moment where we can have some thoughtful dialogue. Um, the first thing I want you all to do is, if you're comfortable and able, to turn on your video so that we can see faces rather than names. Um, and then what we're going to do is, uh, I mentioned that you should be kind of recording, you know, thoughts or things that kind of stick out to you. I'm going to give you a little bit of time to collect those and to maybe kind of think through one or two highlights that you've had um, over what Ryan and Sister Dean and Maria have shared. Um, and then I'm going to use the breakout um, tool within Zoom here to um, create different sessions for us all. And there's 20, well, there's 26 now. So um, I'll be creating, um, let's say, seven groups. Um, and then what's going to happen in these groups, and it's going to feel really rushed, and you're going to feel like you didn't have enough time, and maybe you're going to even feel like you didn't even get past introductions. Um, so I'm going to ask you all to be focused here. Um, and the, what's the, the task in these groups is to really report out, um, each person spend about a minute reporting out their top, you know, couple um, things that they've just found the most insightful or what was shared or the question they may have just to have a little bit of dialogue. And, and you don't want to have a, like a back and forth. It's just a, a sharing out. Um, and there's going to be an assigned facilitator in each one of these groups. Um, so that's going to be a next thing that we're going to do next. But after we've done that in the setting of, you know, three to four individuals, um, we're going to kind of come back as a whole group. And then each one of the facilitators is going to kind of share their groups, their small groups, um, kind of commentary or like what happened, what was said, kind of some themes. Um, and that will be the report out. And then we'll kind of just that will segue into. So what will happen is a lot of people will share a lot of things quite quickly. And then we can kind of parse out what we want to kind of talk about or, you know, we can kind of open it up to more kind of organic Q&A from there. Um, does that make sense to everybody? Nods, thumbs up, questions? Okay, got lots of thumbs up. So I mentioned a facilitator, um, and this is kind of how we're gonna determine who the facilitator is. So um, think about the space that you've been that you felt most alive, and it could be an interior space, could be an outdoor space, but just think about a space and just think about the last time you felt, wow, this is, this is a great space or something is just about it's really inspiring. Um, think about that space. Uh, in your small group, three to four people, what's going to have happen is the person whose space was closest to Grand Rapids um, will be the facilitator. And your job is to make sure we all share and we all have equal time. So again, about a minute each. Um, try to get into just the sharing of the personal reflection stuff. Um, describe we're not gonna do, because uh, that's just gonna be part of the report out. So just focus on the facilitator. Um, the person um, whose most alive space is closest to Grand Rapids is gonna make sure when we get into these breakout sessions that um, we all kind of share a little bit. Does that make sense? Some thumbs up, all right. So before we do that, again, the first step is to just take a couple minutes to collect your thoughts of what has been shared. And that's going to give me a little bit of time to figure out the technology. Um, so I will give you until four on my watch, um, 29, to just kind of think and reflect and collect your thoughts uh, about the information that was just shared.
All right, so there's going to be four rooms. Um, when we started this, there was 30 people, and we're down to 16. <laughs> um, so uh, that said, uh, we're going to break out into four rooms. And again, uh, what's going to happen is I'm going to give you about four to five minutes. Um, and you're going to want to just kind of like introduce yourselves and talk about things and share your experience and um, more or less not do the task. Um, but the, the facilitator's job is to make sure everybody stays on task and that everybody takes at least a minute to share um, just something that they thought or they thought was insightful um, over the past 40 minutes. Cool. All right. So we're going to go into our break rooms in. Uh, Yes, we are all back. Excellent. How'd that go? Did that go okay? Thumbs up, some nods. Bare, barely got started. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Every time I give a little bit more information because I say, I learn like, oh, I need some, a little more direction on how to get started into it. And every time, not enough time is the answer I get. So <laughs> we've got some time now. Yeah, excellent. Um, so here's what's going to happen next. Uh, there are four teams, right? Uh, I took a picture of who was in what, so I, I know who's in which team because that was something that happened last time. I said, room one, go ahead, and nobody knew what room they were in. Um, <laughs> so uh, give me a minute. And so room one was um, Dan, Mary, Michael, and Richard. Who was the facilitator in that room? Yeah, so I was with uh, kayaking in Paw, Paw Michigan. That was the closest to Grand Rapids. So wow, <laughs> that's not very close either. <laughs> yeah, we had uh, Arkansas and a couple in the UP. So nice. I was the winner. So Dan, you mind sharing <laughs> kind of sure. a quick summary of of things that were shared in your team? Yep. So uh, Dick mentioned just the patience and the soap time. Uh, what a cool ad. Uh, to the project and something that many projects do not have, which I think um, added to, you know, the success of the project. Um, Mary mentioned the natural light, um, you know, and, and hearing uh, sister say that she doesn't turn her light on sometimes in her office. That's cool to hear. Um, in uh, fact, I'm in my office now and it's not on. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> Michael mentioned the transition space whenever you add to a building um, you know that's a that's a key component of the transition from old to new um, that he thought did a great job um, and I mentioned I have a junior hire that uh, has gone through a year of COVID and the sleepy laziness so to hear the intentionalness of uh, hey this is not a this is not a building to lounge around and sleep in um, this is a place of learning was uh, really cool. So those were our takeaways. Cool. And there's science behind the sleepiness thing too, by the way. Um, when CO2 concentrations in a room get above like, let's say 1200 parts per million, um, the cognitive ability of our brains declines and we get pre-lethargic and sleepy and groggy. So that's where like the science meets the kind of intention in this building where like ventilation rates with thoughtfully considered balance with energy usage and, and kind of energy efficient strategies were deployed. Um, you know, it was like, it wasn't accidental because there's a lot of thought into it, but like they didn't start with the science, they started with the intent, right? And I just think it's just a kind of a fascinating, again, case study of, of a lot of this stuff. So um, great, Dan, thanks for sharing. Um, room two was Andrew, Ann, and Ryan. Who was the facilitator there? Uh, I, I, we didn't actually get to the facilitation bit, so I figured I'd just kind of, I know them both, so I, I, I just started talking. <laughs> um, you know, and fair enough. Certainly, I think the, the, the two takeaways that, you know, at least from Andrew and Ann that I thought was, um, you know, really gratifying and spoke the process was the appreciation of Sister Damien understanding the value of the design process where um, and understanding that that soak time that they were talking about earlier and how much you know because what we do is hard right and it's a one-off hand-built prototype it's a it's a weird thing we're making and so 
uh, compared to other industries. And so, you know, to have the soak time and to have a client who's willing to push, um, to push for that is, is very valuable. And I think that was the big takeaway for our group. Great. And, and just to comment there, I mean, I, that wasn't the easiest thing to do because I kind of <laughs> did have a, quite a bit of pressure. Like, you know, we've been trying to work on this since 2009. Are you actually going to get it done? You know, <laughs> and so I just had to develop trust with those who weren't directly involved in the process to say, you know, this is extremely important. I tried to be very open. This is what we're doing. I can show you what we're talking about and why we're talking about it. But that took a little while too to get that trust. It wasn't the easiest part. Once that was there, then it was much easier. Great. Thanks, Ryan. Um, room three was Dustin, Aaron, and Megan. Who was the facilitator there? Which one was supposed to be the facilitator? Who was? I think. I think Megan technically closest? hers was the closest location. Oh, okay. I would say the closest or farthest. Yeah. Okay. Mine was the closest. Um, you know, we didn't we we didn't get that far in our conversation <laughs> either. We were still getting to know each other. Um, I uh, um, I know Aaron commented on having been aware of the project um, as a Tower Pinkster employee um, for some time and being interested in hearing more about it. And I felt the same way because I. Um, I live right around the corner, and so I run past um, your building every oh. about three or four times a week. And I was just there this morning, and it's just it's beautiful. I was also a little concerned. I'm I'm a little bit further over and to the west than you sound, but um, the I was just you know it's like anytime you adjust a campus as beautiful as Aquinas is, it's, it was it's sort of this like oh are they going to do okay? And I yeah. it, it nestles in well. It's a beautiful space. But um, one thing that I was struck with was, um, and, and I think Aaron mentioned this too, is how, how long you've been working on this. I did not know that. And I have been, as an architect, I am in those situations now. And it is encouraging for me to know that there is maybe light at the end of the tunnel and that all of the effort is, is worth it and to not lose um, sight in the... Um, you know, in the, that long haul of the, of that, these details do matter. And it's so great to hear from occupants of the building that your lights are off right now. It's just like, what a yeah. joy. <laughs> and they're off just about every day. It's, unless it's at night or early in the morning, I really don't turn them on. So. I'll quickly, oh, sorry, I was just gonna quickly add is uh, a, stud a student who went through the sustainable business program at Aquinas, the oh. in inspiring nature of the space now compared to what it was, especially in the lecture hall where you like, even if you weren't sleepy walking in the lecture <laughs> hall with like, no, it's all dark colors, stuffy, um, not inspiring at all. Like it was very easy to fall asleep. Yeah. <laughs> it was very awesome though. And I, I would wanna also, uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't um, uh, highlight Mr. Temple's contribution. Cause I think he might've been involved in it before I was. Dick, I mean, I've got 2009 in my files. Were you studying stuff before that with Tony? Um, we'd looked at it a long time ago. Yeah. But, but you know, it's, it's interesting to see it's evolved quite a bit from when we first initially looked at it. Yeah. Well, that's I, I, in, in a good way or? Um. <laughs> <laughs> you know, in, in today's environment where everything has to be done faster, better, cheaper. Um, it's amazing that somebody could think about a project for 10 years and, uh, and that you have clients came and, came and went, leadership comes and goes, uh, but the, the theme was so strong that it eventually tipped it forward. Yeah. So, you know, things have their own zeitgeist. They tend to, to manifest themselves when they need to. Mm -hmm. Certainly, you guys hit the sweet spot and came out with a winning solution. Yeah. Yeah, I think when we, um, after we, well, when they started to demolish some of the existing building, Pioneer said to me, you know, it's a good thing you're doing this now because even one more year and this, 
it, it was really, we were, we knew it, we were having leaks everywhere, there was mold, I mean, and they just said, you could not have waited any longer, and we would have been really in a hard space, <laughs> you know, so. Um, well, another, another factor I think that's really important for all of us in, in higher ed is that you're constantly trying to recruit and retain talent, whether it's students or it's faculty. Yeah. And uh, believe it or not, facilities do matter. And uh, I'm sure that you've had great success recruiting new faculty. And I'm sure as you go to recruit students, this is a prime marketing location for any potential candidates. Yeah, that's that's our big hope. I mean, I think that's what was driving the administ the rest of the administration to a lot. Um, but we do we do have a new faculty member who actually is an alum went to Notre Dame, did her post for her doctorate. And now she's our, we started a new biochemistry and molecular biology program. And she's, she's uh, teaching in that lovely, lovely person. But we have one more team, but I think Carl, you're the only last remainder um, of that team. So, <laughs> so I was, by default, you're yeah, it. By the, okay. I was a facilitator <laughs> just by, and it turned out I had the space that was closest. Uh, my space was Cranbrook and um, Notre Dame's campus in South Bend. Um, both of those are just well, always inspiring. Once one inspired for me in um, high school, and the other inspired me just all the throughout my years at Cranbrook. Um, but it to to that extent, um, for me, it was the integration of the site. Um, was inspired the integration of the new to old I thought was just seamless and um, I've only been a tower, pink, a tower pink surf for like four years so I was aware of the project but never I was always curious about it and just driving by all the time I thought it's amazing how clean and it fits well I mean there's just the uh, the trees are it's just I, I was very impressed with the whole process of, of seeing it go up and and uh, and the built piece. Um, Neil's comment about um, light, natural light and sound, the acoustics um, were impressive as well. Um, actually, I had one comment before we got cut off. Is uh, I was going to ask the design team about. Was there any thought of, of um, reclaiming wood? I know the tree, well, the trees are done, so uh, I I know you so many rooms for tables, but anything else in the project that we're thought about or? I yeah, we, oh, go I ahead, sister. No, no, Ryan, you go. So we, we looked at it um, in working with Pioneer. So what they have is effectively a lumber bank because to get the lumber usable in like a commercial or institutional application, it's got to dry for a long time, like longer than the construction schedule would allow. So that was the nice thing with the cookies. And then some of the areas we did a little bit of wood trim and stuff, we were able to kind of basically um, make a withdrawal from the lumber bank and then use the harvested timber from the site uh, to make a deposit back. And so um, it is one of the coolest toys I ever saw from a construction standpoint is they had the big claw uh, chainsaw cutter. <laughs> uh, I remember Bill and I standing out there one day just kind of watching because it big arm goes up, it grabs the tree, a blade just that quick cuts the tree. And then it this kind of, you know, claw machine arcade thing just drops the chunk. Uh, it, it's it's. It was one of the cooler parts of, the, of just the construction for me. We still have some some cookies down in the storage area. If there's something that the college wants to do, I've had requests from other some other departments, like up at the building where the president's office is. They were like, "Do you have any of those cookies? Could we build a, have a table like that up where we are?" So I don't know if if that will happen, but. A fun, fun little story is, is when we were uh, doing a dry run of this presentation as practice, um, both Ryan and Sister Amy Marie mentioned the cookies. 
and I had no idea what they were talking about. So <laughs> I was just waiting here and for the share them. <laughs> like <laughs> cookies, that's that's a fun story. I like stories that involve cookies. Um, but I had no idea what they were talking about. Um, but hearing the story, it's just like, oh, that's that's just that's such a cool story. There's oh yeah, there's one of them. It's right here in the foreground. So it's you know, I, I think you've you've probably seen them on social media where you see the the wood that then is the resin cast table. It's it's that, but instead of more of a um, a long vertical slice, they just took up you know it's I don't know inch and a half, two inch horizontal yeah. slice. Yeah. Yeah. And then cast them in resin. They, or re resin. They turned out really really great. Yeah, they did turn out nice. And we went with just a very simple base. You know, it's just like. A, iron I think but you know just a simple heavy base but not so so I think the cookie stands out you know it's just that simple base and yeah here's the here's the piece uh sister Damien was talking about earlier and it was yeah we just had bridges that were connecting and yeah it was I it was a faculty kind of steering committee meeting and, and was it Beth that asked that it was Tim Oh, he, he, he feels it should be named after him, but I told him not <laughs> until you give the college the big bucks will you get your name on it. But, <laughs> but it, 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 it was such a simple move, right? That you just, yeah. you, you are solving a design problem from a circulation standpoint. And then, you know, I think one of the other pieces is also understanding, you know, and I think Sister Damien did a good job of talking about the variety of spaces in the building. And I think that's important for students because just from a uh, social dynamics standpoint, but also a learning standpoint that everyone needs different spaces, you know, people, you know, participate in the social, you know, functions of the building at different scales and they move, are more comfortable at different scales. And so giving people niched benches and corridors, you know, that was something else we did. Yeah. Um, you know, having larger study areas, having a couple of smaller, you know, more private spaces I think helps people feel comfortable and find their own space in the building. And then they can stay longer and be more engaged and feel more comfortable. And I think that's a, an important, an important piece. This is a little bit of a different topic, but I, I forgot to mention it before in relation to that, like food movement exercise thing, we didn't really have a big focus on that. But one thing we did really focus on was we needed bike racks. Um, and indoor bike racks too, because a number of our professors ride their bikes to, to school and then the students like to ride and we're trying to encourage on campus, we're a bike friendly campus. So we were trying to encourage that. So we did have an emphasis on getting enough bike racks outside and then having indoor bike racks for the winter. And then we also put showers in, get a point and lead for that. So we put showers for the faculty because there are a number of faculty that um, teach, they co-teach like maybe a course in kinesiology. Um, a few, the, one of the biology professors is big into that. And so it's nice because they have a place where they can come and have a shower after they're exercising and doing things. So um, I know it, get, it gets poo-pooed on a lot in lead space, like point chasing, like we'll just add a shower and get a point. Yeah. Um, but I have to say as a cyclist, um, I, I appreciate the showers, but so do my colleagues. And so I'm sure while your, your faculty appreciates the showers, so do your students, yeah. um, just by extension. Um, yeah. But that's a great story, sister. I was glad we did it. I, and I don't, I don't know, maybe it was point chasing, but it's actually turning out to be very useful. And it's something special for the faculty too, which, you know, they're not paid a lot to work at Aquinas. And so this, the specialness of the building and a few of those things go a long way to attracting faculty. So. Well, and that's one of those stories where I remember Sister Damien really kind of putting us to task and it was the faculty offices um, and oh, making, yeah. making sure that, you know, we were, we were, they benchmark at the larger end of a planning, you know, module that we would normally just as a default say, you know, here's your, here's your 10 by 10 faculty office. And that wasn't the right answer here. And so, you know, I think that was one of those things where, you know, creating a great space for faculty too, so that they can really, again, they feel comfortable. And if they're comfortable, they're accessible. And again, that was one of those pieces that even early on in the, in the discussions with the students, they said, we love it here, not because of the building. 
We love it here because of the campus. It's beautiful, but we also love it here because of the access to faculty and that, you know, we've all been in that 300, you know, student lecture. You're kind of lost, but here it's, it's not that, that's not the culture. And so we wanted to be able to give them space that reinforced that culture. Yeah, that was, that was a bit of a, a bump trying to get but we ended up with an average of like a 12 by 12 office for the yeah. faculty. And that makes a huge difference. I went up and measured one of the faculty offices that people were kind of happy with. And I thought, oh, it's about 12 by 12. And when you, you know, it, in the end it worked out fine because we were, we were able to get extra offices. We did need, we need, we had to design for extra offices, but we got them in and I'm, yeah, so. Sorry about that, Ryan, but I did have no, to push hard on that one. <laughs> but that, but that's part of the, you know, I think that was one of the things that made the process successful, right? Is that yeah. um, there were things that we weren't clear were as important as they were. And so, you know, that, you know, and so on us as design, as a designer, it's, it's my job to understand that. And if, and if I'm not getting that, you know, I, I think it's, it's important to also say, this is important. You guys need to to focus your energy there, and I'm I'm yeah. glad we were able to to make it work out in the end. Yeah, and and people are really happy in their offices. I have to say, good over at GVSU, they have ten by tens, and they are and, militant about it. <laughs> and they're yeah, they ha they're like ordered that they have to do it. Nobody's there. I mean, the offices are too small. They um, I think so. I I just feel like at least for the for the quality and the kind of place that Aquinas is, because the faculty are here all the time. I mean, even during COVID, they were all like, we need permission to get in because we have to work. And so very early on, we got special permission to do our health screen and come in all the time. So <laughs> anyway, so. We're running up against our time together. And so I did want to take a moment to see if anybody else had a pressing question for the design team or for Sister Damien Marie before we call it a night. So time for one more question, maybe two. Anybody have any volunteers? No questions? Was there anything we said that surprised any of you? I'll ask a question. There you go. <laughs> Yeah, I had no idea there was a there was an existing bill like that surprised me. That's actually quite high praise. Yeah, to pull that off well. And and that was always that and you know I think that was one of the I think first things that um, President Oliveras, who was the previous president, it was very important to him that it that it not feel like an addition that it felt like it was a a cohesive space you know and it was a cohesive place and so that you know yeah that that's one where um again pioneer did a great job um building the idea and so i think that was um you know it wasn't easy because that it was an old messy structure underneath all of it and so it was but it was one but we're we're glad it turned out the way it did didn't you even use a lot of the original bricks we used some of them. We tried to conserve as much, but also the the wall construction of the original building, and this gets back to the, the mechanical systems, wasn't what we would do now, right? You yeah. know, the, it, it was a, it's too thin of a wall. There wasn't much insulation. So it, to make the mechanical system, you know, we're going to invest all this money in the mechanical. We also want the building envelope to perform at, to a level of sophistication that the mechanical system does. I got one quick closing comment as the old architect in the room. That is just, uh, you know, it's a successful project when the client can tell the story as well as the architect. And sister, you you clearly understand, understand everything about how this facility got developed and you can certainly see you're vested in it and that means that's a successful project. Mm -hmm. Thank you, it's been a, I think it's made me a better person. I think, you know, a better educator, maybe. And uh, I, pretty appreciate rough. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciated working with everyone on it. So. Well done. It's about as nice a thing as anyone can say. <laughs> yeah. Well, thanks, everyone. I, I was 
tremendously excited about this session, this um, presentation, and it didn't disappoint. Uh, thank you, Sister Damian Marie. Thank you, Ryan. Um, I think I learned a tremendous amount. My favorite comment was, um, where'd you get your art? Oh, by the way, those are light fixtures, not art. Um, <laughs> we, we love those fixtures. It's, it's, I it's, try not to use them anymore because it's like <laughs> going to be special there. Yeah. <laughs> um, but thanks for everybody that joined us. Thanks for everybody that stuck with us, um, participated in our little kind of breakout adventure. Um, hope you had a wonderful time. Um, Megan, sorry, Pam recorded this. Uh, I'm going to throw Megan under the bus just because she's the president. Um, Pam recorded this, so it will be available. Uh, if you want to share it, uh, sister, I know we owe you a link. Um, next month, we don't have a, a, a plan yet. Um, so if you have any ideas, we have seven more um, design um, principles to, to highlight. Um, shoot me an email. Let me know if you have any thoughts. Um, next week, uh, Andrew is going to be doing the next 2030 series. Um, I think it's about um, measuring uh, defining and measuring kind of different things within the design process and the importance of that. Um, please join him, check out the events um, calendar on AIA Grand Rapids website. And um, yeah, thanks again. Uh, we look forward to seeing you all shortly. Thank you all. And thank you all for the work you do. <laughs> yep. Thanks everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks, Matt. Bye. Thanks, Ryan. Yep.